right. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to this session of the Sibling Leadership uh, Network uh, Conference. Um, the name of the session is right there on the screen, From Your House to the White House. Uh, and my name is John Kramer, and I'll be uh, the moderator uh, for the session. If your camera's on, just remember we can see you. And if your microphone is on, uh, we can hear you. So please mute yourself. Um, uh, for the for this uh, presentation, um, please use the chat box or raise hand function if you have any questions that you have. I'll monitor the chat and and make sure that uh, you know I I queue it for the uh, the speakers. Um, the presenters will respond to those questions at the end, and I'll kind of uh, help uh, with that um, part of it. So, um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded, and it will be made available to the Sibling Leadership Network members um, in our online archives. And so, uh, I've placed. I'm going to uh, place the uh, link to the handouts here in the chat. Testing my. Uh, Zoom capabilities here. And uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. Thank you so much, John. Um, for those who I haven't met yesterday, my name is Tiffany Banks. I'm a social worker here in Colorado, um, and I have the pleasure of serving on the Sibling Leadership Network um, as the co one of the co-chairs of policy and advocacy. Um, I also have the privilege of serving as the executive director of the SLN Colorado chapter, Rocky Mountain SIB. And um, I, when I'm not doing that, I'm a full-time doctoral student in the School of Social Work at Colorado State University. And I'll turn it over to my, my colleague, Nina, to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Nina. Um, I brought my RBG mug just for this. Um, so, uh, you know, just, I'm also a huge nerd, quite obviously. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance because at least once during this presentation, I'm going to say SNL by accident. I know that we are SLN, but it's been happening all day. I think it's just a thing now. Um, I am a, uh, so like Tiffany, I'm the other co-chair for the policy and advocacy wing of the SLN. Um, I was just named to the board of ARC Michigan. Um, I think that officially happens on Friday. And um, when I'm not doing that, I am a psychiatry resident at the Detroit Medical Center, Wayne State University. Um, yeah, excited to be here. This is my first SLN conference. So I'm actually really excited to be here. Well, so we are thrilled to give you guys some of the highlights as far as what we've been doing lately. Um, and we call this from your house to the White House because a lot of what we've been doing is around family caregiving. And so very short agenda today, but with 30, only 30 minutes, it's a lot of information. So we'll try and get through it and save some time for questions. Uh, we'll first talk a little bit about family medical leave, where some of those policies are at nationally and um, uh, home and community-based waivers. And then we'll wrap that up with some uh, COVID-19 advocacy updates. Um, um, before we go into questions. So I like to always give basic explanations to individuals as far as what types of policies we're talking about. So family medical leave, it, uh, the first FMLA was originally introduced in 1993. It has not changed much since then. Um, it essentially guarantees job protection for unpaid leave for 12 weeks. Uh, it covers medical per medical issues such as the birth of a child, um, serious medical conditions of yourself, um, adding a new member to your family through foster care and adoption. Um, and since 1993, some states have made um, expansions. The important thing to note here is that California, Washington, D.C., Maine, and Minnesota are the only four states that have expanded explicit coverage for siblings. Um, and as we talk a little bit about some of the things that we're advocating for, that's really important to know because we get a lot of inquiries about, do I qualify for family medical leave? Um, and so you do have access to our slides in the link that John had provided in the chat box. And so you're able to click on that red link there and go and see what, what kind of expansions have your state done because it is very individualized the base model of FMLA does not cover siblings unless siblings are considered 
in loco parentis, which would mean that you would have to prove legally that, you're, that you provide a guardian-like relationship with, with your sibling, meaning the sibling would have to be um, requiring 24-hour assistance, um, much more than I think um, a lot of us uh, do, because I believe that family caregiving doesn't have to be uh, that intense labor. Everything that we do um, can be considered caregiving, so the definitions definitely are a bit outdated. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the barriers here, a um, little bit van loco parentis that I mentioned, um, in general too, we'll talk a little bit about paid leave because who in this room can actually take 12 weeks off and without pay? The average American does not have that kind of savings. And so again, this outdated model in which we're expected to be able to survive for that long without pay, I think is really unrealistic. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that not all employers are required to offer FMLA. So up on the screen, you see a photo of me and all of my siblings. I love my siblings dearly. Um, and the one that is in the uh, far corner there uh, having a conversation with me, um, my brother is a, a TSA agent. And as a TSA agent, um, he does not have access to family medical leave or any Title V protections that other federal employees have. Um, and so I actually, as a sibling, when he heard I was doing this presentation, he asked if I would share that with this audience and let you guys know um, there are uh, two bills out there that um, he is currently advocating for that would help give them those protections. Um, and those bills here are up on the screen. So if you're interested in learning more, um, if you were not aware even that PSA agents were not entitled to those protections, um, I won't go much further into that now, but as a sibling, um, I wanted to be able to share that with you guys today. So the the main um, bills that we're that we're advocating for right now, um, one is the Family Medical Leave Modernization Act, and so I have those bills numbers up there for you as well. Um, on the screen, you'll see this photo of Congress.gov. I really like to explain to people too how to like look up the process of where a piece of legislation is. So you go to Congress.gov. You can either put in the name that you're familiar with um, or the bill number you'll get a screen that looks um, like what you're looking at here. And then if you go to um, subcommittees, you can see who, where it is assigned to. That is a really important step because until a bill goes to the actual floor, it has to go through committee first. So right now, these bills that we are advocating for that are up on your screen currently are in committee. And in order to get to the floor, we have to focus on the individuals who are in the committee that it's assigned to because it won't get to a full vote until the committee passes it. Last year, there were versions of both of these bills that did not make it out of committee. And so we are asking certainly for people who um, have a elected official who sits on one of the committees like the Senate Finance Committee, which is where the Family Act is at currently, um, to, to contact your elected officials and let them know that this is something you support and why it is that you support it. So the Modernization Act, this first one here, HR 2589 and Senate Bill 1185, that's the bill that would expand the language to cover siblings. Um, it's really important that that bill passes because even if um, siblings maybe want to or advocate for the paid bill leave, we know that their job isn't necessarily going to be protected. Um, this modernization act really has to um, come through at the same time or, or first for siblings to be able to access this next one. So the Family and Medical Insurance Leave Act or Family Act that is the Paid Leave Insurance Act um, that would help establish 
um, a, a fund that uh, would provide paid leave for uh, family caregivers um, and individuals. So home and community-based waivers, we have some very exciting stuff happening with that currently too. Um, I am not as deeply well-versed in Medicaid, I think as some people, my, my understanding is very surface level, but uh, essentially home and community-based services are not mandated federally. And so what that means is that every single state has a completely different HCDS setup. Um, the way that it's actually set up from state to state varies so much. And um, as we know, that it doesn't follow people from state to state. So when people move to a different state, they start this whole process. Um, if there's a wait list, they're back on the wait list. Um, and that can be very frustrating. Um, what Holman Community Based Services do is they allow individuals to live in their community and not not reside in congregate care settings. We know during COVID-19 that we really established that congregate care settings were quite dangerous. Um, they were uh, particularly high rates right, of COVID during that time. And so I think that uh, an investment in HCDS is long overdue because we continue to have wait lists across the country. Some examples of the services that are provided by HCDS are up here on the screen. Um, and the other important thing to note um, is that the reimbursement rates of HCDS services aren't necessarily um, equal to the cost of living. So up on the screen here, you're seeing just a small diagram from some of my research earlier this uh, year. Um, the gray is the um, average county cost of living in Colorado. And then uh, all of the services are underneath. So you can see that depending on what state in Colorado you live in, you may or may not be able to afford to live comfortably if, if family caregiving is your full-time occupation. And what that really translates to is that people might be putting in 40 hours a day for paid work outside of the home and then still coming home and putting in another 40 hours um, just trying to make ends meet. Um, in some states, you can actually pay below minimum wage for some of these services. And so it is a real barrier to accessing things like um, homemaker services when you're not being reimbursed at rates that are livable. So what that means is that there are two bills currently that we are uh, advocating for and talking uh, with members about. Uh, the first is the American Jobs Plan. At the moment, the American Jobs Plan has a $400 billion allocation towards HCBS increase. It is hypothesized that um, this might be one of the first things that's cut during negotiations. And so in particular, uh, Nina and I have been informed that Arizona, Georgia, Virginia, and West Virginia are states that we desperately need individuals to outreach their members of Congress. And that is specifically about Democrats. So in order to get this um, passed, um, all of the Democrats uh, would need to vote for it so that there would be a 50-50 split and then the vice president would make that, that last vote. Um, so if any of the Dem elected officials who are Democrats in the four states um, that are thought to be possible swing uh, votes vote against it, then we're into a negotiation, which means that $400 billion that is desperately needed may not make it to the people who need it. Um, so definitely share your stories, contact your local officials. If you live in those states, uh, we are, are desperately in need of this money to help reduce wait lists um, and to hopefully um, expand services. The other 
um, piece of legislation that hasn't been submitted yet, so I don't have a bill number for you guys, is the HCDS Access Act. And what that would do is make HCDS an, um, a mandate for all states. And so again, the, the thought behind it is that this bill would um, allow more money to be allocated and more people to access these services. I'll turn it over to Nina. Uh, actually, Tiffany, before you do, there was a comment in the chat of asking about um, FL is FMLA available for people who work for small businesses? Um, my understanding that it was not, and I think that has something to do with the number of employees that are working in a business, and I think my understanding is the rationale behind that is that many small businesses have so few employees that it would be a burden to provide um, family medical leave, um, it, which we can debate whether or not that's correct. But um, I, I just wanted to, you know, uh, throw it over to you in case you had anything to talk about on that topic before we move on. Yeah, so no, that's exactly correct. So uh, businesses could be exempt from it if they are small enough. And I apologize, I don't have that number memorized, but I do know that there is there is a certain cutoff. But that doesn't mean that your employer isn't offering it. So that's an important uh, thing, I think, too, is to just inquire with your employer directly um, with how they're regulating that. Because even if they're small enough to not be mandated, it doesn't mean necessarily that they're not um, still honoring it. Right, exactly. I think someone put a link in the chat that says, um, it's 50 employees, um, so uh, we can go from there. Um, so I'm gonna just spend a brief couple of minutes talking about COVID. Um, I know that everyone is probably sick of hearing about COVID, as am I, um, and this is a very, very busy slide, but the idea was to just show, um, you know, there was, in the middle of being bombarded with whether or not you should wear masks and what kind of masks you should wear and how many feet you should stand apart from other people. There were a lot of headlines talking about how people with disabilities were disproportionately affected by COVID-19. Um, data was very limited um, because CDC and other health departments tended to not uh, accurately count people with disabilities um, in their numbers. Oftentimes group homes were lumped in with nursing homes uh, when it came to data collection, which is, uh, you know, that didn't actually give us the data that we needed. Um, and it actually, I imagine, muddied the picture quite a bit. But from the data that we did have, uh, people with intellectual or developmental disabilities were found to be at extremely high risk uh, for getting COVID-19 uh, about three times higher uh, than those without IDD and um, there was mortality rates were cited to be up to 15 percent um, and then the, but there were other reports that were saying numbers like four times more likely to get COVID-19 and 2.5 times more likely to die from it so it was definitely a concern um, the CDC did create a list of underlying conditions uh, that uh, of, that place people at higher risk of complications from COVID-19. Uh, Down syndrome was included on that list, but IDD wasn't. Uh, and um, so that was the Sibling Leadership Network along with many other disability advocacy groups ended up signing on to a letter to the CDC requesting that the change be made from uh, rather than using Down syndrome using the umbrella term of IDD uh, just because that was in our perspective a bit more of an accurate term of, uh, to use um, considering that Many, many people with IDD um, not only live in congregate settings like group homes or um, other places like that, but also oftentimes struggle to follow social distancing guidelines, not because they don't want to or because they're being uncooperative, but because they don't quite understand. Um, 
Aside from that, schizophrenia spectrum diagnoses uh, were associated with more than double the odds of dying from COVID-19. Um, there were studies that found that after elderly age, schizophrenia spectrum disorder was the second greatest risk factor associated with COVID-19 mortality. Um, so the SLN also signed on to a couple of letters and petitions asking the CDC and the White House to prioritize COVID-19 vaccines for people with disabilities, um, including schizophrenia, spectrum disorders, and IDD. Um, the next slide, which I think Tiffany have control of it, right? So um, yeah, so this is just, I wanted to take a moment to honor some of the people we lost. On the left is Sharon Gowdy. She is, was a woman with Down syndrome who got COVID-19 at her group home and subsequently passed away. Um, on the right is a woman who I particularly admire her story. Um, her name is Leilani Jordan. She had dis developmental disabilities and visual impairment, and she worked at a grocery store in the uh, New England area. She volunteered to work during the time slot when the store was open for seniors because no one else wanted to work that time slot because of, it was probably the riskiest time that the store was opened, but she felt it was important to ensure that uh, the seniors had assistance with getting their groceries. She also ended up passing away of COVID-19 um, last year. So just not to put a bummer on things, but um, I wanted to spend a moment uh, really speaking about um, the people that we lost and um, the, the pain that I think our community has had in particular uh, over the last year or two. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, moving on, the Biden administration has developed a really comprehensive disability policy um, that really has included prioritizing people with disabilities. Um, they've released new guidelines about best practices for congregate settings like group homes and guidelines for direct support professionals and patients or clients. They also were very vocal about making sure that vaccine distribution uh, prioritized people with disabilities and other um, minority groups. Um, on the right, that's a picture of my brother and my parents getting their first shot. Um, I think my brother was mainly excited because it was an opportunity to leave the house, but uh, for my family, it was huge. Um, and I don't know, I thought it was a good picture, so I put it in here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then keeping in mind, um, you know, everything that has been happening over the last year to, to uh, in terms of promoting justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, or the JEDI, as I like to call it, um, the SLN has been uh, really focused on its mission of making sure that we are not only uh, including siblings of all walks of life, but also representing them in our advocacy work. Um, to that end, we received a $5,000 micro grant from Morehouse for their uh, National COVID-19 Resiliency Network. And it was, the grants were given out to groups who were specifically going to be uh, providing minority and underserved groups uh, with information about COVID-19. So considering that our, the people that we serve are oftentimes disabled or family members, of people with disabilities, they uh, included us in their grant. Um, and a large part of our grant is gonna focus on developing plain language documents to develop or to explain neuropsychiatric complications from COVID-19. Um, I know the SLN has another project where we are trying as much as possible to translate documents into Spanish um, to help Spanish speakers uh, understand all sorts of topics related to disabilities. Um, and I think over the next few years, SLN is gonna be seeing a whole new group of siblings um, join us. And those are gonna be the so-called COVID long haulers, the people who survive COVID, but then end up with complications. Um, and because oftentimes their siblings are gonna be the ones who are 
advocating for them just as we have always done. Um, and we're gonna continue to pursue other grant opportunities and um, research into improving the goal of making policy more inclusive uh, for all. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so I think that is essentially the end of our presentation. Um, I know that there were some questions in the chat, so I'm going to. I can. Yep, I can. Uh, Nina, I can uh, jump in there. Um, I, I think the and I want to be mindful of our time. We've got to uh, head out in like two minutes. Uh, I think the question that I saw was uh, there was a question on stat. Uh, is there a statistic on the number of siblings in the United States? Not that I am aware of, um, but I think average household in the US is still 2.4 people. So um, 2.4 per family. I, someone could do the math on that. It's not going to be me because I'm not that good at math. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, another question quickly, uh, are there are there insurance benefits for SIB caregivers? No, not that we're aware of. No. Okay. Uh, yeah, no. Um, all right. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any other. I was going back a little bit. I think that's it. Any, any other questions from the audience? I am going to uh, post uh, the link to the next uh, next session, which is called Table Talks. I'm going to post that in the chat here. Um, Deborah writes, I've been promoting dialogues about the view of public services to the needs of brothers and the importance of involving them in relationships, not only in terms of finances, but also in terms of services. Yeah, definitely. Can we advocate uh, for those insurance benefits? Um, we can certainly try. Um, it, it would definitely be a process, but I think it's a good thing to consider. Um, Allison, I saw that you mentioned something about having um, issues with getting vaccination accommodation for people with autism in your state. Uh, feel free to reach out to me um, or to Tiffany. Um, about that and anyone else can too. If you're struggling with um, finding accommodations to get your SIB or any other loved ones or people you know vaccinated, um, that's definitely something that we can help with um, in, that, in, in the near future. <laughs> Good. All right. Uh, thank you both. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. This concludes uh, this session. So uh, make sure um, you click on the link there. I'm going to post it again, just in case it went up the screen for you uh, for the next uh, session, Table Talks. And uh, we'll see you there.